timing, timing of the market. What does it mean in the startup world about timing? This has been a conceptual term in the rules of the game in raising capital, fueling your dreams, and gaining the needed resources to make the impact you're committed to making as a founder outside of your respected branches uniform. Ambitious Vet, find out what this means, along with screening the right investors, what most early stage veteran founders fall short on, and much, much more from 22 plus year retired army officer to successfully exiting and co-founding another impactful fintech startup company, John Gossard. He doesn't hold back, Ambitious Vet, around just really what it takes to make the impact you want to make as a startup founder and become the leader you want to be outside in your new civilian uniform. Stay tuned. There is, there's a relationship between luck and skill, right? So like, it seems like the good people always seem to put themselves in the right place to, to be lucky, right? Yeah, right. Um, so you were lucky that, like, I don't know, that you made this catch, but it was your skill that put you in the stadium in the first place, right? It, Want to help us shift how you are viewed in the marketplace? If so, Ambitious Vet, join the fight now by supporting our qualitative research study in partnership with the University of Texas San Antonio, where our mission is simple, to serve the 65% of the 230,000 that are getting out every single year right now, which is a post-9-11 vet that's leaving their first post-military career, right? We already know that's happening. And we're also realizing that you as an Ambitious Vet are realizing... <laughs> no pun intended, that resume writing, interview prep, and job fairs, they have a shelf life to you actually finding the the prestige, the impact, the purpose, the self-actualization that we all, we desire when we get out of the uniform, right? For us ambitious ones that are getting out, that is. I don't want to throw too many big words. We do need your support. If it's connections, if it's funding, if it's uh you know, just you wanting to support and distribution. We need your help. This fi- this white paper that we kind of fell into after a huge failure in 2018, where we realized that we were fire hosing you with over 5,000 hours of content, either through Facebook or through this podcast, not really hitting your key pain points. This is actually going to reveal the top seven things keeping you as an ambitious vet up at night and educating the government entities, the veteran advocates, the Fortune 5,000 HR managers that are still not getting it, even with the $240 billion budget that just got approved this year. Also, it's going to reveal that mental health is only one side of the solution. Uh, The generation gaps within the veteran workforce and what's missing in the tools to empower you. Uh, Recommendations on how we can actually eliminate the false narrative, how veterans are viewed in the marketplace. See, you're not a charity case. You're actually a strategic asset and it maps that out. And much, much more. I could dive into the innovative UTSA's Edo scenario-based technology that heat maps um, some of the, the the pain points that we were able to identify with over 300 vets in 31 states. But Ambitious Vet, if you're listening to this still, I want you to go and click the link in the show notes below. Check out what we've been able to do over the past year that's going to innovate and push the veteran community forward. More importantly, empower you to actually self-actualize. Not just get your basic needs met, not just build intimate relationships and have a sense of belonging, but really figure out what's going to build your self-esteem, your confidence, and uh, have you feel like you are feeling successful in the trenches of life. Again, click the link in the show notes to learn more. We can't wait to dive in the trenches and uh, help solve this problem with you. It's time to get into the trenches, dig dig into your purpose, and, and fire up your life fulfillment. Vicious Vet Podcast starts now. What's going on, Ambitious Vet? We are right back inside the trenches today with John Gossett. John is an adjunct professor of public policy at Georgetown and co-founder and COO of Good World, a fintech startup that connects corporates, causes, and individuals with digital tools to drive impact. Good World was named one of Fast Company's world's most innovative companies and a top 25 veteran-owned company by Forbes. Before founding Good World, John and three other veterans launched smart city startup Ride Scout, 
which was acquired by Damier Mercedes in 2014. Before becoming an entrepreneur, John served 22 years as an Army officer and in the government work sectors. John, welcome to the show, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, so go ahead and fill the gaps inside that introduction. Let us know a little bit more about your background and uh, one personal fact that a lot of people may not know about you. Uh, no, I think I, I think you covered it, or at least you covered all the good stuff. I don't know. <laughs> Everything that I might add would detract. Anything about the Army, uh, I went to Boston College. Uh, I was excited about getting in there, you know, because where I'm from. And the only way I could afford to go there was to take an ROTC scholarship. I had, you know, no prior experience or under I couldn't spell Army. Uh, my dad was invited to serve in 1968. Uh, so that was the extent of kind of our Army service in the family, so an heritage thing. Uh, by the time I graduated from BC and was commissioned a lieutenant, even though I thought I was going to go in the reserves and, and, you know, and do something, I realized I was not qualified to do anything. And the army was offering me, you know, like 40 guys and, and pay and, you know, I'm going to let me travel and maybe even blow some shit up. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I ended up doing that. I meant to get out after four years when I paid my, um, paid my dues and 22 and a half years later, I finally got around to that. Um, you know, so that was kind of the first chapter of my life. Uh, I was in Yemen, kind of on the tail end of, I, I moved over to the counterterrorism side. I was, uh, I was working in the uh, combating terrorism and uh, special operations office in the Pentagon. So I was doing a lot of Pakistan and Yemen to East Africa. And that's when some guys that I had taught economics at West Point with mid-career reached out and they had an idea for a startup. And I was working with some of the most bleeding edge technology on the planet but I still had a flip phone and I didn't know what an app was. Uh, and, and I will tell you how bad this was when they, when they emailed me and said, we got this idea. We want you to be like the revenue numbers guy. Uh, I read it as we're going to SXSW to demo or, or something. That's how I read it. Mm. because I didn't know what South by was. Yeah, all right. So right. I was in, in a different world. Um, but anyway, the timing was perfect. Uh, I was, you know, going through some family stuff and I really needed to get off the train. I'd been, you know, largely away from home. I had four sons that were all kind of by that time, middle school or junior high, high school age. And, uh, you know, I came back and uh, got off the train and, uh, and jumped on the Red Scout team with these guys. And you know, my wife was very supportive. Uh, she said, yeah, like all our kids are in private Catholic high school and get ready to go to college. And this is a great time to quit your job and join a startup where they don't pay you. And I was like, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> we did it. And uh, we were fortunate uh, to exit. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's it. A lot of luck and not a lot of skill involved in that uh, uh, in that story. Wow. Well, um, you got to break that down a little bit more, right? Because, you know, we hear, we hear the buzzwords of like work ethic hits luck, you know, work ethic creates luck, stuff like that. All those, all those one-liners from motivational speakers yeah. and stuff like that. And one thing I appreciate about you, John, is you don't hold back on what it takes to earn an exit, right? Um, and even, man, I'd love for you to hit on um, after serving 20 years as an Army officer, not looking back and still going and, and serving and doing an exit instead of a startup. Like, what does it take to do that? You know, you said no luck. Like, what does it take to really go and do that? So I, I don't know. I, I, I was probably slurring my words again. It, it, there was a lot of luck. A lot of luck. Okay. Sorry. Maybe I didn't hear that right. No, yeah. No, no, that's, that's probably, that's probably me. English has never been my strong suit, but um, no, I, I think, when I look left and right at entrepreneurs in general, you know, in this space, I, you know, we're in fintech. So I see like a lot of brilliant people and I watch them, you know, come in and I watch them exit. And then I see them come back around and do something else and exit again. They are, uh, you know, people that I look up to, they're, they're smarter than me. Unfortunately, they're younger than me. Um, I don't see myself in a lot of that. Um, so I think those guys are getting it done on skill. Uh, I won't speak on behalf of the other three, you know, kind of ride scout guys, uh, Joseph Kopser, founder and CEO and, and Craig Cummings, co-founder, uh, chairman there. Um, but it, for, for me, it was, it was learn as you go. And for me, there was a lot of luck involved in it. 
Mm. And there was a lot of timing involved in it, but the timing wasn't, wasn't by design. So it kind of turns out, you know, back to be luck. I, I will say there is, there's a relationship between luck and skill, right? So like, it seems like the good people always seem to put themselves in the right place to, to be lucky. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so you were lucky that like, I don't know, that you made this catch, but it was your skill that put you in the stadium in the first place. Right. If you're not even in the park, yeah. then you'll never make that catch. That's good point. If you're somewhere in the park, it takes some luck for you to make that catch, but you're in the park. Right. So uh, I worked for a guy in Dave Perkins a couple of times and uh, he, he ended up being the trade out commander, but, great guy and he told me once when I was a lieutenant that luck is a residue of skill never understood what he meant hmm. until I got out of the army and I'm like that's right yeah so you can't be mad like you're like why is that guy like always seems that shit falls as the head. Midas touch or whatever right yeah he doesn't he's putting himself in the right place or she's putting herself in the right place and and so it's less lucky because she's in the park right <laughs> Whereas if you're anywhere else in the world, you're definitely not going to make that catch. So I don't know. That's probably oversimplified. Um, I, I think that on the ride scout front, like Joe Copser, Joseph Copser had this amazing idea, amazing vision. Um, and we worked hard. I mean, we did. We were also pre-revenue and it was also the easy money period between, you know, kind of 2010 and the beginning of 2015 where there was so much fear of missing out by VCs, especially out West in the Valley. Uh, there was so much pressure on institutional capital to get into seed rounds because, you know, the LPs were screaming, why are we missing this unicorn? Well, the answer was most of them really weren't unicorns and they were open about. But the upside of that was you could draw on a napkin if you were engaging and you had cred and you had a good idea and you could, or, you know, raise money. Interesting. Uh, Joseph, Interesting. Joseph was great at that. I mean, he was the guy that got on stage and inspired people and pointed and, you know, he wasn't talking about our app. He was talking about autonomous vehicles. Mm. You know, he was talking about the future of smart transportation. Where is it going? Yeah, he was the spokesperson. And yeah. there was so much water between us and Daimler Mercedes that they were like, holy shit, we want to do this. <laughs> and, and these guys over there in the United States, we keep hearing about them. They're already doing this. And we've got to quickly go over there and, you know, and figure that out and maybe scoop these guys up. Wow. Um, it was definitely the, the, um, we, the blowfish effect. I mean, we were, we looked a lot bigger from a distance than we were, but the idea was big. I don't take anything away from Joseph and, and Craig. It was a big idea, but we were pre-revenue and, you know, it was. Sometimes, sometimes when you got a big vision, people will buy into that more than, you know, Potentially just the, the attraction that may or may not be there, right? That's what I'm hearing. Um, In timing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Timing of the market and, um, and, and identifying that as well as a founder. Because that's not easy if you don't have a business background either, right? Um, it's just not. But for the listeners that don't know what a unicorn is, what is a oh, unicorn? Sorry. Yeah. I, I, I hate using like douchey startup words. <laughs> uh, and, I, and yet I'm doing it. So uh, unicorn is this contrived term that, uh, that venture capital and entrepreneurs have come up with to describe a company that has a billion dollar valuation. And I think most of your uh, listeners understand what like a valuation is. Um, when anytime you raise money, it's going to be tied to some, you know, kind of proxy. Uh, if it's, if it's, you're actually selling shares in your company, it's an actual valuation. So you know, I'm going to sell this many shares at this price pre-money based on like, you know, this company's worth 10 million and I'm raising 4 million. Mm. Uh, and so that tells you how much the shares, it's a simple division problem. Uh, when you do convertible nets or uh, convertible notes or safes, uh, it's a little more contrived, but there's this thing called a cap that's kind of, you know, a, a proxy for valuation. But a unicorn would be something that the market values at $1 billion. Um, not every unicorn or anything else that's valued is necessarily actually that valued, uh, but it is a fact. If someone will invest in you at the terms that value you at a million or a hundred million or a billion, then it is fact that you're worth that much because that's what the market said, hmm. even if it's a stupid market. And sometimes it is. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, 
I mean, you may or may not know the answer to this, but do you think the market, like, you know, we're in the startup space, we've just kind of merged into it over the past year. And um, for any ambitious vet that's just kind of listening to this uh, over a couple, a couple whiskey or even a morning drive, may, they may want to know this as well, but. Or both, right? No, I'm yeah, just yeah. yeah. Whatever, Whatever you're doing. A couple whiskey in the morning. To- <laughs> exactly. We need exactly. disclaimers. We don't want people suing the ambitious vet. That's true. That's Record true. Disregard. Oh my gosh, totally. So, with the market, if the market has like one trillion dollar, one trillion dollar buying power, or over a million people that you can potentially gain in that market. Do you think that increases like the valuation, for example, for an ambitious vet that's listening to this, it's just like, how the hell do I raise the valuation of my company for a merger acquisition over the next five to six years? Since we are on that topic, is it, what is it dependable as far as increasing your valuation? I, I don't know. I mean, it may depend on the industry too. I, right? I, would, I would say if you're starting with my intent is to build something that is going to have some value on to sell it, then I think while there's probably certainly some of that from serial entrepreneurs that like they understand how to start, um, go to market, scale, you know, they know how to raise, capitalize, and then offload. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's some kind of wash, rinse, repeat, but I think that most entrepreneurs, you know, that are, I, I don't know. I think the vast majority of entrepreneurs, it, it, it's coming from some place of passion. So they're not starting and raising the first dollar and telling investors, like, I'm going to like do enough until this has some value and offload it. Yeah. And investors don't want to hear that. They want right. you know, they, they to buy into the vision. Mm. They want to they wanna believe what you're selling. Like Adam yeah. Newman, like people believed what he was selling. Now he fucked them, but they but they believe they believe what he was selling because he yeah. believed it. like he did. Um, so I I didn't go into that. I went into that first off. I mean, my story can't be replicated. I I went into it with those guys at Ride Scout to buy myself some time to figure out how I was going to get another job. Hmm. I wanted to come home. I'd been kind of largely gone from my family for you know, 10 or 12 years. And I was going to try to come home, do some triage on that, screw around with these guys on, on something that, that probably wasn't going to work. And then use that time to, to figure it out. And, you know, we raised money, we kept raising money and then we exited the company. Wow. And now I'll never work for somebody again. Like that definitely. That's that. freaking incredible, brother. Like that but is amazing. That is not, you know, there's nothing to do with uh, you know, my skill uh, or, or my outlook. So I, yeah. I, I wish I had good advice, but you can't really, you can't do what I did because if you tried to, like you wouldn't have a good outcome. I, I think I was just very lucky along the way, as far as what entrepreneurs should be like thinking about when it comes to like, how do I make my company more valuable? It, it comes down to like one thing and one thing only, and it ain't team. I can't stand these investors that right. Most important thing is, and and I'll talk about one in a second, but it's the problem, right? If you identify a real problem that addresses a real wide swath of addressable market, it's immediately interesting. And you haven't even started talking about your solution. If you have actually identified a problem that affects a ton of market, it's interesting. Like you have my attention. If you're pitching investors or pitching anybody on your idea, and in the first 30 seconds, you aren't saying something like, hey, you know how it is when this happens and that should be a bad thing. And if you're not seeing people's heads nod like, oh, yeah, that's a terrible thing, then one of two things. Either you've made a terrible assumption about how wide that market is. You know, you're like, isn't it awful that when you're, I don't know, when you're wearing, when you're lacing up your pink chucks that, you know, it gets dirty on the right side because you're right-handed. Well, you know, nobody like, yes, you and seven of your friends have that problem, but nobody else. So who's going to pay for that? Right. But when you say, doesn't it suck when you're trying to get a cab and like there are no cabs around and what if you could just open up your phone, click and a car would come. Wouldn't that be great? Oh my gosh. That's not the pitch in the first 
30 or 60 seconds. Isn't this bad? Yes. Everybody's nodding. Wouldn't it be bad? Wouldn't it be great if, if it was this way? Yeah, and right. oh, by the way, I got a solution that couldn't make it that way. Yeah. The other thing though, though is you got to make your, make sure you're pitching the right investors, right? Because if you're pitching med tech guys, yeah. then they might not nod their heads, but that doesn't mean your idea is not good. It doesn't mean that the, that the problem's not big. It just means that you're in the wrong room. Oh, 100%. And even, I don't know about you guys that were pre-revenue because it sounds like you guys got acquired pretty quickly with that, which still a hum- amazing story as far as how you fell into the opportunity and exited. But for us, even being a pre-revenue company and growing a huge user base, what we're doing, the biggest challenge we've been is we've been falling into the wrong ponds of pitching VCs that are more looking for later stage companies with already a product that has a, you know, some revenue over $1 million and versus going towards like friends and family, angels, family offices and stuff like that, which is, I know a whole nother topic and, and stuff like that. We don't need to dive into that, but I just wanted to kind of share that kind of landmine that we've hit over here at the ambitious fat network as we raise money for our e-learning platform. But I, but I think though, I mean, I think that's an important thing to mention. Yeah. If like, regardless, number one, I think there's gotta be that problem. Like if you're not identifying yeah. your problem, like, you yeah. know, so, I, so I hammered that. Um, I, I would also say that that's screening criteria, right? Yeah. So whether you get in the door or not, but once you're in, the evaluation criteria, and again, people will say team, team, team. I don't think it's team. I think it's timing, right? If you're too early, then nobody's going to buy it. If you launch Airbnb in 1996, nobody's going to. No. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, if it's too late then the market's too crowded, right? So somebody like Via comes in on, on car sharing, it becomes very hard to, to differentiate, right? Yeah. But when you when you hit that sweet spot, and I can tell you, we did it not by design. <laughs> uh, that's that's my thing. I, I would tell you, you know what? I'm an officer would say it was all by design. And I don't doubt him, right? Big visionary. But, but you're not always like meticulously planning that timing. Sometimes, you know, you have the idea and it's too early. Sometimes you have the idea and it's too late. Sometimes you have the idea and it's, it's spot on, but mm-hmm. time is absolutely in yeah. my mind, the most important thing. Give you one quick example about why team isn't it. Um, the Washington Ross, well, I'm in DC right now. I'm not a Redskins fan, but the Washington Redskins won the Super Bowl in 83 and 87. I think it was in, or maybe it was 91. So they won three, but on one of these, they had a running back named Timmy Smith and no one knows who he is. He set, a record for the most in Super Bowl history. This is a uh, a journeyman who didn't last in the NFL more than like four years. And what yeah. happened was you had this amazing offensive line. It was probably the best offensive line ever built in the history of football. And so you could have Timmy Smith run behind it. Obviously, he's a mm-hmm. professional athlete. So we had to have that minimum you know, like skill, he's a professional athlete, but he didn't have to be Jim Brown. He didn't, you know, he didn't have to be Barry Sanders. And so if you give me a problem, like an addressable market, that's huge. And you don't even have to give me a solution that guaranteed will work. Give me a solution that might work. It's kind of like in the military, right? There are two types of plans, one that won't work and one that might work. So give me a solution that might work and give me like an amazing problem then I can put, you know, an average team behind that. They can't be idiots, but give me like a com- competent team and I'll bet on it. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great. I love that analogy, right? Problem is the number one thing, right? And that's what leads to our next point. Because one thing that we were talking about inside the pre-interview was going from idea to actually solving a profitable problem in the market. Like you've addressed it. Um, starting to address it right now, but let's dive into some learned lessons from your exit, right? What were some learned lessons around taking the idea to creating a profitable problem to where it did lead to, you know, an exit or um, what you see in the startup world? Because you're obviously very immersed in it. I'm just getting into it, man. And this world is crazy, 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 right? So, um, how do we go from idea to creating a real profitable problem in the marketplace? 
Yeah, again, I mean, I hate demurring, but, you know, if, if I tell you I know and then kind of lay out how you do it, I'd be lying. I, right. I, I Just from your learned lessons. Yeah. We were pre-revenue uh, at Ride Scout, but yeah. again, like the vision was huge. And I think that what Don Mercedes was buying was that vision. And yeah, we had a technology stack. You know, we, we, we had an app, we had business partners um, and they were, you know, they were buying all that. But I think that, again, it was timing, yeah. right? I, I think there was a lot of fear of missing out in that market, both in the capital market, uh, in the LPs and the VCs that were investing and in the strategic investment, right? Like, yeah. I think your listeners probably know the difference between institutional capital, like VCs are investing, and that's only based on the return on investment that they're trying to get. Whereas strategics are investing because they're trying to bring the company, the technology, the team, whatever, closer to the larger company to, you know, to develop their business in a way that could also benefit the strategic, right? So, you know, we were in talks with Hertz at Ride Scout at about the same time that the acquisition came up. So mm -hmm. like Hertz would be what you call a strategic investor versus a Sequoia or a Dreesen or you know, whatever uh, on, on the VC side, right? Right, right. So Daimler, if they hadn't bought us and they had just invested in us, they'd be trying to shape where we were going in a mm -hmm. way that would benefit Daimler because now they're kind of shareholders. Uh, of the company, but right. I wish I could answer that question better. I, I don't know. I think that the first iteration, um, we had a great team. We, we had good timing and we, uh, we had a great vision. Joseph had a great vision and we were lucky. I mean, mm. we we're lucky. And then on good world, um, you know, I, I've learned a lot of lessons, but I still screwed up a lot more than, than I did well on, on Good World. So we've raised a little bit over 4 million, you know, MasterCard's the biggest uh, investor on our cap table. All that sounds very impressive. Um, you know, we're doing good revenue now, but we're not profitable and we still gotta figure out how to turn the corner. So mm. I, I wish I knew, you know, yeah. maybe when I hang up, somebody's gonna call me and say, they're acquiring me, but I, <laughs> you know, I don't think so. And, and, you know, maybe we don't want that just cause you know, there's a lot of people looking for fire sales and, you know, I, I, I don't think we're ready for that. I think we're, you know, we're going to scrap till we make it or scrap until we exit to something great for our, our investors. Yeah, no, I think that's great coming from a 20 plus year army officer too, being able to scrap, fight, do those small battles um, and keeping, keeping things moving forward. Right. I know you're not a fan of the fluff. I'm not really either. It's kind of like, this is what it takes, but I mean, who better? than a co-founder than an army officer in the trenches yeah. of growing a startup, right? The, the people that you and I served with that we admire, yeah, I, yeah. I, I agree. Well, yeah, you know, I guess I can't go through one question without being uh, <laughs> sure about it. Oh, um, well, yeah. I think, I think that there are people that are not in the military that we know that we admire that are scrappers that, you know, whatever they touch is going to be good. And then maybe there's proportionately more of those people uh, that we run across in, in the military uh, or as officers or just in the military uh, in general, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, mm -hmm. I know there are, there are people like clearly that I would, you know, I would lay down for, True. There but are shitbags. There are shitbags. The army, like our our, yeah. like our family. Like I know there's right. people in my family that I would lay down for. Right. Uh, and oh, by the way, there's shitbags in my family that I would lay down for because <laughs> like that's what you got to do. Mm -hmm. But I do think that there's a couple of of bad trends in the last 25 years uh, when it comes to veterans and it comes to you know the 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 civ mill relationship. Tell and I think more about that. Is that we've we've created this badge that that you need to wear politically that says if you're more conservative, you're more supportive of um, you know of the, of the military and its mission. And and I'm not talking about foreign policy. I'm just saying you're more supportive of you know service members. Uh, and if you're uh, if you're less conservative, you're not. Uh, I I think that's problematic. Um, 
you know, I'm not getting political here, but I'm, I'm just like, as from a historical perspective, it seems like, you know, the left gave us, uh, they gave us Vietnam, they gave us Korea, they gave us World War One, they gave us World War Two. I mean, <laughs> what else? They, they give us Bosnia. <laughs> I mean, what, uh, uh, you know, they're they're not shy about it. All these, all the greatest hits. Um, but I also think that it is is become very dangerous that when you come out of the military, even if you spent a hot minute in it, that you are held up in our society on some pedestal. Um, because if you don't hold these people up on a pedestal, then you're kind of shunned uh, mm -hmm. in society. And so they're all heroes. And, you know, we know better. They're not. And, and you know, you, you said it, there, and you're right. There are some shit bags in the army and they were shit bags in the civilian world. And then they, they didn't do very well in the military, right? And so unfortunately, a person that beat his wife and did drugs and, you know, I'm not saying doing drugs is bad, by the way, but I'm saying that, that you know, that let that interfere with his or her duty um, that stole, you know, in the barracks, that person, it doesn't matter if they're in the military or not. Like that person is probably not a great candidate for a lot of things. Right. So good point. first off, we got we to gotta make sure that we, we disavow ourselves of the notion that everyone that serves and comes out uh, is a hero, right? I don't know. Maybe yeah, that's, 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 a, that's a definitely a stigma. It's something to think about, right? Um, because it is. It's, we're finishing up a white paper over here on Arnda things where we surveyed over 300 ambitious vets in 31 states. And mm -hmm. one of the biggest things that this white paper is going to, you know, kind of bring to the surface and kind of debunk is as kind of like this myth, to your point, trends over the past decade is hiring veterans for charity work. Like, hey, they deserve to get hired based. Because or anything, right? Not just charity work. What, what yeah. are if, and here's another thing. I think that you're doing a disservice to, to veterans to, to put out the notion in society like we do, or, you know, it's not really businesses that are saying this themselves. It's not, it, it's not the market. It's more political. Mm. That we're saying that, you know, if you were a, a, a mid-level manager in the military on, you know, the not commissioned officer side and the commissioned officer side, that you're walking into what, like a VP position? Oh, by the way, unless that VP position is in, you know, infantry, which yeah. I don't know a lot of infantry companies out there in the, in the private sector, you, you're kind of starting over. Mm -hmm. So yes, you have some of those skills that translate, you know, you're good at at leading, you're good at managing people, you know, you might have some other discrete skills, but if you're moving into like some sector that's, that's outside of your core expertise in the military, you're, you're starting over. If yeah. somebody goes from, from cyber to construction mm -hmm. and, and some cyber firm, they're not going to walk into a construction company you know, as a VP, you no, know, they don't have the human capital for it. They don't have the experience, yeah. the skill, the credentials or anything. Yeah. But the danger is if we tell these guys that, you know, like just because you were in and just because you led men and then, you know, a very smaller percentage, you know, led men and women in combat, that when you walk out, if we give these people, these people is me too. And my son, who's a, uh, a Marine Corps pilot, if, if we tell these people, that that's what they should expect, then we're setting them up, right? Because like when when they aren't getting jobs that they're applying for, we're not helping them by saying, here's what you need to do to start a second career successfully. Now, if you want to go be a contractor and, and, and tap into your core expertise, there's a lot of awesome career opportunities for that. But as an entrepreneur, not a lot of, of your on paper stuff translates very well. And, and you have to be able to swallow your ego and pride a little bit. Oh, yeah. And understand that you're, that you're starting over. Yep. I totally I'd agree be working with that. for people that are younger than you, too. I totally agree with that. And I think there's multiple personalities that do get out of the uniform, too, as well, right? And then we'll dive into the, the, the last topic because we want to hear more about this new company that's already raised $4 million, Good World, which is a fintech company doing amazing work for impact purpose centered brands to raise money. Um, just amazing um, you know, company here. But um, there's multiple personalities that are getting out of the uniform too. And one I was pointing out with what we found in our research was the veteran that's getting out 
getting contingency hired as far as volume being pushed in an entry level position may or may not be deserved, but um, you know, they're actually leaving their first post-military career within 65, uh, to, within 24 months, 65% are right. leaving whenever they get out, right? And right. they're they're kind of like, okay, how you know, I'm leaving this this career because they had no career career development, training development. I was a great tax write-off at the end of the year. But I mean, I'm looking for a bigger challenge. I'm underemployed and they're starting to find themselves outperforming their peers. And that's what we've been able to find with our research, plug into our listenerships. They have multiple careers um, or they just go and say, hell, you know, I want to be like John and go start my startup company. Right. Um, Because I just need to have this mission driven mentality because. It seems like no one else is really doing it, right? So there the, is the lack of sense of urgency. I think I think something that you know a lot of uh, combat vets feel, especially you know like like people that have you know had maybe more uh, uh, intense like periods of deployment. Um, I think one of the things that hits people like immediately is the lack of sense of urgency hmm. in the world when you get back. Yeah, um, and you know that's a good point. Whether you're in garrison or whether you're deployed or whether you're deployed and getting shot at, um, there's always a sense of some some sense of urgency. And I think that's one of the, the things I had the hardest time adapting to when I came back. And I think, you know, talking to people, it, it, it's similar, is that there's just like, don't these people have to be somewhere, whether you're driving on the roads or whether you're, you're like walking on the sidewalk or you're standing in line, you know, or trying to get from one place to another. It just seems like there's there's not that sense of urgency. So I'm not saying that there's not some universal things that, you know, people that have served only they understand and there are skills that they bring that you can 100% assume, right? Mm -hmm. You might not be able to assume certain things about core competencies and, you know, like we said, chip bags are chip bags, but, you know, fortunately they're in, they're in the vast minority uh, in the military. Uh, You know, I like they are probably in general, but I, I think that there are, you just got to know that there are a few things that absolutely translate, take with you and hug and be lucky that you learned them when you're in the military and that they're a part of your ethos. But there's probably just as many things that you got to leave behind. I, you know, when I came in uh, to, to my first startup that I was running, the hierarchy does, d- didn't work. Like I didn't realize that like engineers, they'll, they'll never like fight you they're conflict averse, but they will shut down and, you know, they will uh, stop yeah. the whole operation. Right. So to withdraw. Yeah, for sure. You have to find the way to lead the organization you have, not the organization you want. Mm. Right? So that's, that's an amazing golden grenade right there. Can't treat it like a, uh, can't treat it like a platoon or a you know, company, I guess, so it yeah, company, but it's a different kind of company. Right. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, definitely different skill sets. Do you struggle with your payroll processing or other HR compliance needs in your small business? If so, check out Get Payroll, a Vietnam veteran-owned company who has been in the industry for over 30 plus years and is now disrupting the fintech industry with their payroll app. Fully integrated payroll, timekeeping, and HR at your fingertips, Ambitious Vet. They also have U.S.-based customer support, internal revenue service advisory council member on staff, U.S. tax court practitioner on staff, and 100% cloud-based compute computing um, with no IT overhead. And get this, if anything happens as a result of your processing, they're going to take care of everything and anything that has to do with employment tax regulating authorities, including the IRS 100% guaranteed. So ambitious vet, if you're ready to streamline your HR and give up those late night headaches, streamline it at an affordable price, fully compliant for your small or midsize or large company. Click our affiliate link in the show notes below and get started now. Now back to the show. There. So tell us more about Good World, all the good work that they're doing. Um, and then we'll wrap up with your last yeah. golden grenade and say goodbye. I, want to, I won't spend uh, you know, a ton of time. You can look us up at goodworldnet.com. Um, basically, we're solving the problem that uh, there's 99% of companies in the United States that don't really have access to an impact platform. Benevity and, and a couple others are, are big in the space and they're helping corporates and causes, uh, you know, have 
you know, social impact so that customers will differentiate and, uh, and do business with them, that employees will differentiate and work for them and can stay with them, you know, and, and prevent the churn. But if you have 5,000 or less employees, like the big players in the space, they're not, uh, they're not interested in that. And, you know, 99% of companies in the United States, 43 million employees, uh, have less than 5,000 uh, employees in their company. And they don't have an option that's not cost prohibitive, staff intensive, or, or owners to maintain. And so we provide that. We got about 4,000 uh, nonprofit partners. Uh, we've got huge corporate partners like MasterCard and CHC and Citibank. And you know we're, we're in the pipeline with a lot of great brands like Allbirds and Dix and, and, and others. So we're, we're solving that problem because people, whether they're employees or, or, or consumers are demanding values alignment. They're demanding uh, some sort of impact mission from the places where they spend their money or the places where they, they work. So that's the problem we're trying to solve and, and MasterCard and Nika and others are investing uh, in this idea that we have. Yeah, yeah, yeah that social impact um, initiatives in the world is definitely a big deal right now. And you guys are definitely nailing that down. Um, before we say goodbye, John, what's one last golden grenade that you would drop in here for an ambitious vet that's been out for at least a, a couple of years, um, has kind of lost that sense of purpose, satisfaction, has figured out how to get career stability, but is just lacking something in life. What would be that last little golden grenade you'd throw in here for that ambitious vet? Yeah, I, again, like I, I want to be inspiring, but I guess, you know, the freaking Irish in me uh, <laughs> is cynical. But, but I will say this, I, I think if you're going to commit, like you got to commit. And I know it sounds simple, but, you know, I, very small scale, I'm an angel investor. I sit on a couple of boards. Um, certainly, I, I've been on the other side of the table right, and I'm doing it right now, raising money, raising money, you know. I think one of the detractors, the big detractors from like making your pitch is if you're still doing something else and you kind of haven't put your own dollars against it. Now, maybe you can't, but you also haven't kind of leaned on your family to put their dollars against it. Friends and family money is the most important. It, it's, it's tiny, unless you have rich family, I don't, it's tiny. The reason it's so important is that's the money that keeps me up at night, all right? It's not MasterCard's money that I'm losing sleep over. Oh, MasterCard's getting into. It's not Nike or Fenway Summer Ventures that I'm worried about. It's my former lieutenant that begged me and I tried to push him off, but he, he thought I was holding out on him, <laughs> like eating <laughs> money because he heard about Ride Scout. He's like, why won't you let me in? I'm like, fine. But I mean, that 25K, that keeps me up at night. If I can't give him a return on like money that I, I feel like he probably was a little bit of a stress for him to give, that makes mm. me good. So friends and family money is important. Your own personal investment, if you can make it, is important. Mm. The fact that, that you're not doing this on nights and weekends is important. And, and, you know, and there are some people that, that physically can't. I get it. There's a lot of great like, side hustles that evolve into billion-dollar companies, right? But I do think when you're, when you're asking somebody to write a check and you're saying, bet on me, if you're also working full time and you haven't asked your friends and family for money and you haven't put your own money in, then it begs the question, you want me to bet on you, but have you bet on you? Ooh. Has your family bet on you? That's good. That's good. That's good. No, I love that. But I, but I know it's good. Yeah, I mean, it hit me. It hit me. I mean, yeah, we've, we've done a great job putting our ass on the line with their own money and friends and family money. And I just think for an ambitious vet listening to this, that's just a little bit hesitant for jumping into that lake, jumping into that pond is going all in. And even knowing what it looks like from an investor standpoint, investing in, how does that translate linguistically right. on what commitment looks like from a business standpoint, right? That when you have a founder that doesn't have an MBA. So really good point. Um, John, where can an ambitious vet find out more about Good World and connect with you? Uh, you can just go to goodworldnow.com. Um, I am not a hard person to find. I mean, I'm pretty blue collar. You can always email me at john at goodworld.me. Um, LinkedIn, whatever, I'm, I'm, I'm very easy to find. 
Perfect. Well, Ambush Event, all those links will be in the show notes below. John, thanks so much for spending a little extra time for, with us today. And uh, thanks for just spreading out the breadcrumbs for the rest of us Ambitious Vets to follow, brother. Take care. Yeah, thanks for, for having me. The Ambitious Vet is available on all popular podcast platforms. Go to vettrainingcoaching.com to subscribe, rate, and share with fellow vets. Again, Ambitious Vet, if you have not already, click the link in the show notes below and join our fight where our mission is, is to support the Ambitious Vets like yourself that is listening to this right now that has gotten out and realized that immediate transitional tools like resume writing, interview prep, and job fairs, um, they, they, they serve a purpose, but they also have a shelf life, don't they? They don't provide that deep sense of purpose um, or the tools needed to help you build your self-esteem, your confidence, and just help you feel like you're living a very successful life in your own purpose, right? So um, this white paper, this qualitative research study that we've partnered up with uh, University of Texas, San Antonio, rather, um, it's going to be impactful rolling it out from June all the way to August, probably November timeframe, and we need your support. So go check it out and help us bring to the surface what ambitious vets like yourself is dealing with after career stability is a done deal. Check it out in the show notes below.